Now I really don't care to talk about how adult people decide to lead their private lives. It doesn't interest me in the slightest. Every grown ass person is free to do with their life as they like. Make their own decisions. Seek happiness as they please. Suffer their own mistakes. Unravel their own discoveries. That's your own business. But the moment you open your stupid mouth and start peddling harmful worldviews and normalizing idiocy, you make it everyone's business. So here we are. Let's get demolishing. You may have noticed that Snapdragon and Callum just disappear from the story somewhere along the boat, right? And there is a reason for that. That being the writers have decided to jam this entirely separate B-plot into this episode, starring Snapdragon's gender issues, Cal acts as the narrative tool Boogeyman, same as before, that's why he's here. But what about Snap's bestest buddy Amaryllis? Well, obviously, she can't be present to shield Snap from the mean mean comments coming from Cal. Otherwise, the situation won't escalate as intended. So, she needs to be yeeted from the mission. To facilitate this setup, the writers nerf Amaryllis, forbidding her from using her explosive magic against the octopus mecha. Instead of following the example of the galaxy brain bestest ever, except not really, except yes, really, Sage, and just instantly blasting the target from here to eternity, Amaryllis uses the far less effective axe inherited from Snap inherited from his father. Everything just happens. Logic be damned. But that's an overused spice at this point. So I'm not all that impressed. Anyway, the whole reason for Cal and Snap coming along for the mission in the first place is so that they can have this exchange. It's peaceful being on the water. Don't you mean in the water? I know you'd rather be swimming with the other mermaids. What are you talking about? I just think you and the mermaids are gonna get along well. Why? Oh, come on. Like you don't remember gallivanting around the autumn processional? You love making such a splash in your mermaid costume. It was just a costume. I, I know I'm not a mermaid. No, but you loved dressing like one, didn't you? All mermaid up like the frothiest queen of the sea. Shut up! Your dad must be thrilled to call you his daughter. I said shut up! <laughs> Snapdragon, stop! Ugh. Ugh. Freak! Ugh. Whoa, what was that about? Did you see what he did to me? I'm out! I'll find my own way back to the academy! Cal states that Snap liked dressing up as a mermaid, which is true, and he insinuated that Snap has a certain feminine streak, which is also true. That's the whole narrative behind his character. So Cal tells the truth, and Snap flips out and turns violent. We are supposed to root for this character, right? Plus, if you unironically sit like that, you deserve to be mocked. Laying it a bit too thick there, you out of touch sexist piece of shit. The triad would want me to suspend you. I'm giving you a second chance. Okay, so there is supposed to be some kind of penalty for assaulting a fellow student? Why is Parsley still attending the academy? Oh, right. Because as there is an icky toxic masculine hetero man, you can be as violent as you please, as long as the people you hurt said something mildly offensive. That also happens to be true. In 2077, what makes someone a criminal? Should have known you were stuck up. There are no consequences for Snap. Caraway turns instantly accommodating, covering his ass, looking for any and all excuse not to suspend him on the spot. Because Cal is an icky toxic masculine hetero man. I feel like I'm the only one being punished. Will he be in trouble for the shit he said to me? Of course. This isn't new behavior for Cal. Oh, so Cal has spoken truths coded in mild sarcasm before? What an awful human being! It would be rather hypocritical if Snapdragon ever said anything sarcastically to anyone. 
Sage and I were obsessed with Gorner's grunts as kids. <laughs> They're the funniest books ever. <laughs> That'll go over well. Professor, we cited a pop-up book for eight-year-olds as our primary source. I should be out there with the girls. I need you as lookout. We all serve the mission in different ways. Right. Every moment is teachable. Cut the sarcasm, Snapdragon. And if Caraway is referring to the asserted physical bullying, as is the case if Parnell is to be believed, then that begs the question how come Cal isn't already suspended? It would be more effective if we actually saw the bullies being bullies. That way we just might empathize with the plight of the oppressed. A single proper Nelson Muntz moment would at least paint the proper picture so that the narrative isn't all over the place when it comes to morality and standards. If anything, every time Cal and violence interact on screen, Cal is on the receiving end of it, either being threatened or outright abused. The show's agenda is blatantly clear. Cal is an icky toxic masculine hetero man, so he can act as the punching bag, fuck off, and die in a ditch as far as the show cares. Snapdragon is part of the alphabet community, therefore he gets special treatment. Caraway knows this from a narrative standpoint, as in he read the script, and adjusts his own conduct accordingly. And I can prove this. Here's an interesting clip from episode 9. Cousin Anise, Allo, this is my friend Snapdragon. Nice to meet you. Look at that costume. Amazing, Snapdragon. I absolutely love it. It's nice to see you looking so happy. Thank you. That statement makes no sense without the meta-knowledge about Snapdragon's transitioning arc. These two have not exchanged a single word of dialogue prior to this moment. Happy? Compared to what? Caraway isn't even one of Snap's primary teachers. He is on the warrior track, and Caraway is a magic teacher. The writing is trying to foreshadow future events. Except that this is not foreshadowing, this is jumping ahead. The authors are salivating so hard about this scene that they just can't help themselves. It would be silly and hilarious if it wasn't so forced and pathetic. Back to here and now, Snapdragon shares his sad, tragic, feel sorry for me backstory. His violent outburst is justified because his family was mean to him. Are we ever going to hear anything of the sort for Cal? What's his tragic backstory? He doesn't have one, because he doesn't matter, because every icky toxic masculine hetero man is a monster, who was simply born a monster, and can never become anything but said monster, unless they cut off that pesky icky toxic masculine hetero man dick. I take your little thing, see? I put it into this little hole here, and nip the tip. Now let's see that flashback. Give us your best show. Reveal all the horror Snap has gone through so that he ended up so wounded and brooding and violent and deserving of our sympathy. Get off, Yaro! Give me the river, buddy, wuss. <laughs> You sound like a girl. No, 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 no. Where's the real clip? This can't be real. The show is fucking with me. Oh, you are actually serious. You actually want me to take this seriously. The mean older brother tormenting the cutesy innocent Pokemon while grinning like a supervillain and taunting the poor helpless Snap. <laughs> you sound like a girl. No, he really does not. He sounds like a boy pretending to cry. Considering that Snap has to cry not once, but twice in this episode, it would have been pertinent to give the voice actor a couple more takes. Or just send them back to school. This is just embarrassing. <laughs> I wish to remind everyone that this was written, edited, greenlit, and acted out by a bunch of adult professional people. 
and target it to a mature audience. Get that Saturday morning nonsense off my face, you talentless retards. No, don't! What's this, sons of Hawthorne? To the show's credit, to alleviate the absolute cringe, we are introduced to Barnan, the most magnificent character of the show. Just look at that ridiculous exaggerated lumberjack physique. Look at that bush. Look at that steel in his gaze. Can you just feel how his presence triggers every insecure wimp with daddy issues daring to lay eyes on him? I took Snap's dumb pet. You let Yaro take your pet. Snapdragon, I have something you want. Take it from me. Come on, boy! <laughs> <laughs> Good! If he takes what's yours, react! Boy, spend less time with pets and more time sparring with your brothers. We'll make a warrior out of you yet! <laughs> Are you kidding me? This baby is off the charts! But in all seriousness, the lesson Hawthorne is trying to teach his son is solid. Albeit his approach is less than ideal, he should correct the older brother for stomping on the weak. That's not sparring, that's just being a dick. That's a mistake on his part. And as for Snap himself, he clearly isn't the type of person to fully understand a common sense example. So a better approach would have been to break down the message and explain it. Allow me. Violence will always exist. There will always be bad people who wish to hurt you and your loved ones to rob away the things that are most precious to you. So, you have to be ready to fight for those things. You have to be strong, not only physically, but also mentally. You have to steal your mind and be ready to act when the call to action presents itself. Because if you just curl up and cry, and suck your thumb and stick the other thumb up your ass, then you will end up with nothing. This is not only about physical conflict, mind you, but life in general. Strength is not just about the muscle. That's the core message. It's not the message the writers are trying to give. Their message with this scene is merely, Oh, look at that masculine man being toxic and violent and teaching his boys to be toxic and violent. But disregarding the agenda of the show, that is the actual message Hawthorne's lesson implies. And Snapdragon has learned none of it. His violence is not in service of protecting someone. His violence is him being a little bitch and throwing a hissy fit because someone dared to speak the truth at his face. It's weak, it's self-interested, it's actually toxic. But that is something Snap has learned on his own by misinterpreting his father's intent. Cal disrespected me. You wanted Cal's respect, but what you got was his fear. They are not the same thing. Caraway manages to drool out a single proper statement out of his agenda-driven mouth. Good on him. Except the show does not agree with him. Snap continues to shut down Cal with fear in the following episode. Who put you in charge? I did. You got a problem? No, no problem. I just wanted to know. Again, violence is bad, unless the one oppressing others with threats of violence happens to be part of the favored group of people. That is the show's idea of justice, hypocrites, each and every single one of you. In my experience, there's more than one path to becoming a respected warrior. If you've chosen the violent, reactive path, then we're at an impasse. <laughs> it's like she's fucking five! Hey, dipshit, every single justifiable act of violence is reactive. Or do you live in some kind of minority report society where people get sentenced for crimes they haven't even committed yet? By definition, 
Violence is reactive. It's a response to a desire, you absolute fool. Unless you wish to expand on that statement in some way, that set of words is gibberish. Every time this show tries to comment on violence in any way, it's empty nonsensical posing. But all of this talk about aggression is nothing but sophistry from the self-satisfied 100% female so stunning and brave writing room. An appetizer of absurdity, easing in towards the actual intent of this storyline. I don't think that changing course would be so easy for me. Why not? I... I'm not like my father or my brothers. Changing course wouldn't be easy for you. Because you are unlike your family. Fuck me, could no one be bothered to revise the script so that the lines spoken back to back make some modicum of sense? Non sequitur garbage dialogue, someone was paid to do this. I hate being big. Well then it's a good thing that you aren't. My boxy shoulders and this. What are you talking about? Your shoulders and chin are the exact same as every single character in this show. Do the writers not know what their characters look like? My dad had a full beard by the time he was 12. I don't want that. I want smooth skin and smaller hands. Your hands are the exact same size as Rosemary. What the hell is this twink talking about? And if you are after smooth skin... Then I'm sorry that your genetics have dealt you with freckles. Is... Is Snapdragon a self-hating ginger? I don't know, it's like... The girls... They look so strong and beautiful as mermaids. I want... I want to be a warrior like that. The problem with you is, you're completely delusional. You heard it straight from the source. What Snap wants... Is literally a fantasy. Let's lay this out nice and clean. This, all of this, does not exist. I'm not talking about the mermaid part, I'm talking about the whole warrior woman who still looks like a tiny, fairy-like, feminine, cutie ball trope. That does not exist. You cannot be a warrior like that. Physical prowess takes muscle mass. I can't believe this is something that has to be explained to anyone. But apparently too much cartoons and anime and Marvel movies have completely destroyed the average person's view on reality. Sorry to break your fantasies, but if you take the average boy and the average girl, let me just underline that, there we go. If you take the average boy and the average girl, give them the same training, same equipment, and pit them against one another for a fight to the death, the boy is going to murder the girl every single time. Now, fiction is fiction, fantasy is fantasy, empowerment fantasy, and action stories in general operate on an allegorical basis. It's not so much about literal physique, because suspension of disbelief and all that, the point of these kinds of simple shounen-esque hero stories is the idealization of fighting for the sake of others and the virtues that you believe in. That's the baseline, that's the universal core of all these stories in some capacity. It's the willingness to risk your own life for others rather than whether or not you can realistically do it. <laughs> I'm the girl with the gall. But of course you are. And it's not just about girls versus boys. It's the same thing with children versus adults. It's just as ridiculous to pit a 14-year-old against an adult fighter and expect it to end up in any other way than a one-sided pummel fest. Yet, fiction often has differing ideas. That is why some kind of superpowers are introduced in so many action stories to even out the playing field. But at that point, the story enters the realm of allegory. The messages are not literal. 
This is why so many stories with female leads nowadays fail so hard. The narrative tries to assert that women can literally do anything men can, except the only way they can do everything that men can is by having some variety of plot magic on their side. The message is in dissonance with the plot, and thus it doesn't function as it should. You cannot have the message of you can do anything if the way to achieve this is literal magic. And as for that altruistic hero stuff I just mentioned, stories like this, High Guardian shite included, don't give a rat's ass about any of that. The writer's idea of being powerful is doing whatever the hell you please with no accountability. To them, strength isn't something to strive for so that you can do good for others. It's about being cool, hedonistic, egotistical, hollow. And this is the point where this show absolutely fucks up its own narrative. Because you cannot mix allegorical and literal messages. You can either be a warrior with boxy shoulders and strong physique, or you can be someone with more petite frame. But at that point you have to go looking for another calling. You cannot have both at the same time. And this is not locked to any kind of male-female dichotomy. As I said, averages are averages. But the potential of people is diverse. Males can be many things, while still being male. And females can be many things, while still being female. Males can be strong, males can be frail, females can be strong, females can be frail. However, you can only be one of those opposite things at once. Snapdragon wants to be frail and strong at the same time. That is an oxymoron. His desires are delusional, the writers are delusional. And if Snap wants to change himself physically in any way, he can just put on a ring, drink a potion, there is no way that any person with their cognitive functions intact could ever witness the girls turning into mermaids right before their eyes and still miss something this obvious. Transformation magic, like any other brand of sorcery, is not rare, it is readily available in multiple forms. I already went over this, but the fact that body modification and being trans is not already commonplace in this universe is an utterly ridiculous notion. The show is trying to tell a story about Snapdragon realizing he is trans, straight-faced, as it would function in our reality, but at the same time the show is also doing the fucking attack helicopter meme. They told me I could become anything, so I became a mermaid. And now I'm also going to eat this tasty bowl of hot cold ice cream. It is mental. This entire storyline is a joke. The writers are so far up their own ass and sniffing their own farts. They are so high on their shite that they don't even realize what they are doing. They are turning this very serious story, which they want you to take very seriously, into a parody of itself. But you can't change what you were born into. Snapdragon, listen. You say I can change paths, but it's not like I can just stop being a guy. Oh shit, he said the magic words, you guys. Now look at Caraway instantly pounce on that like a cat at freshly caught cod. Do you know anything about transition magic? You can just sense the writing team frothing at the mouth. One of us, one of us, gobble gobble, gobble gobble, one of us, one of us. Let's review the facts. Snapdragon is clearly traumatized by his childhood. He hates physical masculine traits, 
because he associates those traits to his male family members who were mean to him. Part of that is him being a dumbass and unable to realize what his father was teaching him. And part of it is the family being cartoonish meatheads, as dictated by the incompetent writers. I would actually have liked to see Snapdragon's mother at some point, just to see what her part is in the family dynamic. But that might have given complexity to the issue, so that's obviously a no-go for the show. Conveniently never even mentioned. In any case, Snap is horrified by the notion of ever resembling his father or his brothers in any way, physically. Now this trauma is reinforced, as his crush hammers in that boys are emotionally stunted, and girls are so much deeper and better, making Snap hate his existence as a boy even more. Further fuel to the fire is poured as Sage screams her pants on the spot when she sees Snap dressed as a girl. Snap thirsts for Sage, and Sage gives him positive attention when he presents himself as a girl. So being a girl seems like quite the fantastic prospect, all things considered. Snapdragon? Hey, Sage. It was Amaryllis's idea. As a side note, Amaryllis was apparently the one to suggest the costume originally, not as a joke, but because Snap is fabulous. I... I shouldn't have worn this. Snap! You're a fabulous mermaid goddess challenger and, and, and you're great! Again, important people in his life pushing him towards certain ideals. Now aside from all that, Snap also lives in an academy where every boy is either a mumbling wimpy freak and friends with all the girls or is just like his brothers and outright hated by everyone. So no wonder Snap doesn't wish to associate himself in any way with masculinity or rather the straw man version of masculinity this show is presenting. If the show is to be believed, boys are just the worst. Except if they are in fact secretly girls. Snapdragon is obviously not all there between the ears. He launches into violent fury because someone stated truths in a mocking tone. That is completely unhinged behavior. Part of this is because of his experiences. But some of it is also due to the fact that he is in fact a stupid teenager. And the average teenager is already absolutely retarded. So being a stupid retard is just a whole another level of brain rot. Seriously, the reason we have certain laws in place, age limits and such, is to protect young people from their own stupidity. Snapdragon is clearly not capable of making rational decisions. His hormones and traumas are in full tempest mode in that developing head of his. Or as Sage would put it. Everything in here, it's just anxious and chaos almost always. So the show itself admits that teenagers are guided by their out of control emotional side instead of rationale. But at the same time, the show tells us that it is a good idea to tell a traumatized, developing person that the way to feel better about themselves is to stop being a boy and become a girl instead. How about new? Snapdragon is so stupid that he wants Sage as his girlfriend. Think about that. Snap wants to finger bang that. He does not possess the mental capacity to handle any kind of serious decision. He isn't even close to reaching that point. I wouldn't trust this person to decide which kind of vegan burger he wants from the local fantasy McDonald's. Throwing aside the ridiculous magical horseshit because that is not how things work in reality. 
In reality, there are consequences for body alteration, it involves hormones and mutilation, irreversible acts upon your body, but this is the kind of conduct that this show is asserting as desirable, telling a mentally unstable child that the way to feel better about themselves is to alter their physical body. The first thing, not after referring them to appropriate counseling, not after working through their traumas, so that their ideals about the world and themselves are assuredly in perfect order. Nope. First thing, become a girl. I I had no idea that that what did you call it? Transition magic. <laughs> I didn't know that it existed. It's like you get to become yourself, your your true self. But it seems exhausting and and what would my family say? Would they still even want to be my family? Snapdragon, you have time to figure it out. There are so many paths to becoming your true self, and this one is mine. I'm not saying that it's yours. There are always more options than you think. Good. At least there's some self-awareness. Let's just put this verbal shrug here, so we don't get called groomers. Oh, you don't have to do the thing I suggested. There are so many ways to become your true self. But you should totally do the thing I suggested. Wink, wink. The events on screen suggest that Snap is casting away his boyhood to become something else. So this wishy-washiness gains you nothing. You already did what you did. Your game is clear as day. Thanks, Professor Caraway, for actually listening. Now, it's time for you to head back to the Academy. I'll summon you a boat. Uh, I'm not in trouble anymore? <laughs> well, that's up to you. Mm. Obviously, finding your true self doesn't involve any kind of soul-searching, humbleness, actually bettering yourself, admitting that your mistakes are in fact mistakes, and you can't just keep blaming the world for the fact that you yourself are a shitty person. Nope. None of that pesky responsibility. There's nothing wrong with you. You are perfect as you are. It's just the shell that's all wrong. Not your ideals. Not your soul. The physical aesthetic is the thing that's wrong. The appearance is all that matters. That's what defines a person. What a petulant, self-indulgent, insane ideology. If you offer this kind of out to a pathological person, from a position of authority no less, it's going to imprint on them instantly. A person who compulsively places the fault for all their troubles on the people around them, and the universe for dealing them a shitty hand, is not looking to improve themselves. They are seeking anything that absolves them of all accountability, Admitting that you have to improve is mentally taxing. Working on oneself is a path that lasts a lifetime. But it has to start somewhere. The point of counseling is not to coddle the person in need of help, but to pinpoint the cause for their irrational behavior and work towards ways to shed those patterns. Immediately shifting the issue from mind to skin achieves nothing. All that this solution is going to do is embolden Snap to continue operating in the way he currently does. Every trouble he'll ever face will be someone else's fault. Nothing is on him. He doesn't have to improve. He is never wrong. Reality is wrong. Reality must change. This kind of thinking will ultimately leave him and everyone around him miserable. And cultivating someone's harmful behavior like this is irresponsible to a malicious degree. Caraway is a narcissistic sociopath. He found his happiness in a specific way, so obviously the person in front of him will also find theirs in the same manner. And since the creator is talking to us directly through their self-insert, I have no qualms about extending that description to them as well. And if anyone honestly thinks that there is nothing iffy going on here, 
Even after I just broke down this retardation unambiguously, then I can't help you. You are a lost cause. Go stick your head back into the same blender you used to slurry up your brain. All of this is the show's crowning jewel of failure. Beyond all the other stupid crap, broken storytelling, horrible characters doing idiotic things, dialogue written by toddlers, embarrassing production, even worse than any of that, this is what seals the deal and makes this show utterly worthless. Specifically, the writers have failed in their stated goal. It's a very modern reflection of the world. Our characters are really diverse, our cast is really diverse, and that's one of the things that excited me the most about it. We are 50% female in all the creative roles, and our writer's room is 100% female. The creator's prime intent is to offer a positive representation to groups of people not getting their due screen time in media, allegedly, especially women, especially alphabet people, except that every character in the show is some variety of pathetic, selfish, idiotic, violent, hypocritical, delusional, borderline psychotic, piece of human garbage. Who the hell would ever wish to be represented by these kinds of people? The show isn't helping anyone, it's not offering positive role models, the show has done nothing but give yet another reason for anyone with half a brain to mock these whiny imbeciles for being talentless and having their entire personality consist of nothing but their victim complex. This show is reinforcing every negative stereotype people might have about the alphabet people. Half of Caraway's existence is him talking about his sex life and gender identity and the other half is him being incompetent at his job. Snapdragon is an idiotic ball of angst and rage and lust, blaming everyone else but himself for his problems. And then we have the main culprit himself crying on Twitter about getting dragged into the culture war. You pathetic weasel shit! Who do you think started all this? You were the one who made this garbage heap with the intent of selling your idiotic ideals to the audience, promoting yourself as the greatest creature who ever walked this earth, and bashing one side in the culture war while elevating the other. No one dragged you in, you placed yourself there. You and the rest of your gang of retarded inbred wolverines are doing the exact same thing as every single modern day pop culture author who is gifted a prepaid platform to speak their moronic mind. Your art is soulless, it's propaganda, with writing and production befitting such. And guess what, just like everyone else who tries this, you failed to a hilarious degree, you haven't helped your cause, you've only made the people you claim to represent look like insane clown people. You and people of your ilk are actively creating bigotry by normalizing the fact that alphabet representation is synonymous with incompetence. That is on you. And that is not my view, by the by, not even close. But that's the effect this kind of art is having on the world at large. How about we just move away from all this horseshit, stop focusing so much on identity, and shoving that identity down everyone's throats, and just tell stories. That's all I want, just cohesive storytelling, starring whoever the fuck you choose. Just write something that isn't 100% retarded and it'll get far kinder reception. I can promise you that. In any case, Snap is trans, huzzah, the arc is complete, everything is sunshine and rainbows, right after one more brief snippet of laughable drama. You've been so quiet. Are you okay? My wrist feels like it's on fire. Yeah, this amount of wanking will do that. Wanna hear the most annoying sound in the world? <laughs> oh, 
hands now. <laughs> I like your nails. Would you still like me if if I painted my nails? Only if you promise to stick to flattering colors. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Snap, I'm here for you forever, no matter what. Whatever's going on, it will be okay. And you wanna know what's real funny? This sniffling is placed in between the main gang crying over the death of the dragon. The drama of a literal death is interrupted for this. Because these two things are of equal importance in the minds of the creators. Fuck this. I'm almost done. One more to go. Just one more to go. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon. As well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.